I usually try to talk about the psychology of stuff. Well, today, what I want to do was I want to talk about the psychology of something, but I want to talk about one of my favorite passages that talks about the psychology of becoming you and how the process happens of identity formation. And I'm actually going to read some stuff from a, uh, a passage out of the Bible. Now, if you're not a person of faith, that's fine. Don't, don't worry about that. I'm not going to be, you know, uh, giving you something you're not going to be able to relate to, you know, because you're not a person of faith, because the principles in here, I think you are going to be able to relate to um, in how they work in identity formation. Now, there's one part in the very beginning that does pretty much relate to faith, but the actual construct of what somebody has to do in their head to make this work would relate to you in a certain way if you don't, as will become clear as I go into this. So here's the question. How do you become you? Who are you? How do you find out who you are? And, and I'm going to submit a premise here that to some degree, all of us are operating every day as adults, even in some percentage of who we are and some percentage of who we're not. You know, psychology for many, many, many years has, has, has talked about this idea. It's not new to psychology. It's actually talked about way back in the Bible when Jesus referred to people as hypocrites. Remember all the times if you've read the Gospels, even if you're not a person of faith and you read it in literature class, you read the, he's having these discourses with the religious people. You know, these are the church people. You know, think of this, this dude walks into a church one day and says, you bunch of hypocrites, you brood of vipers, you snakes. And that's what he called all the preachers. <laughs> think about that. Well, here's what's really interesting about identity formation, which is what we're talking about. When he says hypocrite, you hypocrites. When we think of religious hypocrites, what's that? You know, we all, and it's kind of a morally imbued term, you know, and it's negative and all that. Here's what's really interesting about it. <clears throat> the word hypocrite basically meant an actor. So we're going to go to the Oscars to see which hypocrite wins the Oscar. We're going to go to theater to watch the hypocrites. The hypocrite is an actor. We can see how that took on the religious meaning of somebody acting like they are, <clears throat> excuse me, certain kind of religious person. But it's all an act. It's not real. So this concept of us being a percentage of who we are vis-a-vis -vis the people we're interacting with or the world at large is, it's not a new idea to psychology, but what psychology did was when they started to work with identity and express identity formation, as well as express clinical syndromes, then you see emerging in the history of psychology, you see emerging this concept of the true self and the false self. And that that actor's mask, the false self, the mask we put on to show to the outside world what we think the outside world is demanding from us and needs to see is different, that mask, than what we truly feel but more than what we truly feel when you get to identity, it's who we truly are. So I wanna to get to that part of it today, this who you are. And as I was saying, in, in our relationship to life, all of us at some point are functioning in some percentage of who we are. And some percentage may be a percentage that we're afraid to express afraid to be known, afraid to be seen, afraid to try, afraid to grow into. 
because it's not going to be liked. It's not going to be accepted. All of that kind of stuff. You could get canceled, right? And by your family, even if you say what you really think or pursue, how about this pursue who you really are? I worked with a man one time who was a uh, a a pretty well known surgeon who was the son of a famous surgeon who had started a big medical center. And it was just assumed that the son of the founder would become a famous surgeon as well. That wasn't who he was. He was an artist and a musician. And you know what? He didn't pursue art and music, except in his spare time. He kind of became what he was molded into be until well into his career, his real self started creeping out, knocking at the door of the back of the mask. I'm here. I'm here because it had been not listened to for so long. And you know what that real self did? It found a way to get free from being conformed into having to be a heart surgeon. It found a way out. You know what it did? It started leaving sponges in people on the operating table accidentally, of course. And who knows? Distraction, not really in the game. How does it happen? But there were a few enough incidences in malpractice suits to where decided to, uh, the hospital helped him to decide to do something else. <laughs> so that's an extreme example. And, you know, happens. But sometimes when our head's not in the game, we get distracted because we really want to be or do something else. Now, that's an extreme example. But how many times do people get conformed into, in the Bible verse, I'm going to read you the passage talks about this pressure to be conformed because the world or your family or the system around you is trying to turn you into someone you're not, to silence you, to change you, to have you fit in, to have you be a mold. That's why we see a lot of times what's called teenage rebellion and blah, blah, blah. So what do you just think about this in the psychology of it? This is how the Bible speaks about it. And it's really one of the only places, I mentioned this in passing the other day at one of the thoughts. Um, it's one of the only places, you know, you people you see people a lot of times going, uh, you know, how do I find God's will for my life? Well, this is one of the only places where it actually tells you specifically <laughs> how to do that. And uh, this, is what, this is what Paul wrote to the Romans as he was spreading the good news of forgiveness to all of the Greek world. And he said this, after he had talked about all of, look, God accepts you. He accepts you just like you are. See, that's the preamble to this, guys. You're loved and accepted just like you are. And not only just like you are with all your failures and all that, but God designed you to be a certain kind of person. And then he says this, therefore, see, there's the, what's the therefore? <laughs> well, what's this passage therefore? It's because of everything he's already said. You're loved. God made you to be you. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, what in view of God's mercy, 
See, all of identity formation must come in view of love that somebody has for us. A kid cannot go be who they are if they're not clearly in view and seeing the love around them that their parents, their family, and their community, we love you. So they got to be in clear view of being loved first to find out who they are. Second, identity comes after love, not the other way around, which is the stupid message you hear from pop psychology. Like you're going to love yourself first in order to be, yeah, it's not going to happen. We got to be loved first from outside of ourselves. You don't take a baby and, you know, toss me into a room, love yourself into maturity, and then you'll be strong enough to love somebody else. No, that's not how it happens. Anyway, so we start by being loved. <clears throat> and then he says this, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Give yourself to the one that loves you. Okay, that's part I said. Some of you, some of you aren't going to be able to relate to that particular verse of this if you've never surrendered your life before God. Say, so how did you make me? Who do who do who did you? And it's not like who do you want me to be? I'm not going to have a life. It's really more integrated than that. Is who did you design me to be? I want to find that. I want to find out who my Maker made me to be. It's like a car fan. I don't want to be a juggler. I want to be a car. Show me how to be the car. And so here's the part you can't identify with, even if you're not a person of faith, that you have got to empty yourself first of all preconceptions. Because you don't know where those came from. And the journey on finding identity is a journey of going into it's like going into a gold mine. We don't know what we're going to find there. Don't go in with a bunch of preconceptions. You might find silver. Or you might find gold like you've never. But don't go in thinking you know anything. Let's start by being curious. Who am I? I'm going to be open to everything. It might be possible. If you had told me. Even six months before I changed my major to go into psychology, that I would go into the field of psychology, I would have told you, I don't know what you're smoking, but give me some because I got a lot of friends I could sell it to for a lot of money. They want some of that stuff because you are high. I didn't have a clue until I emptied myself before God. Anyway, we got to empty ourselves of all these free. Now, here's what here's the point I wanted to get to about identity. Here's what it says after you go, okay, I'm open. All right, I'm open. Immediately it says, do not conform false self, giving into pressure. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. See, the world will squeeze you into its mold and the systemic pressures. Do not conform to those pressures of these patterns of the world, but instead be transformed out of all of that crap in your head. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You got to learn to think differently about who you are, about what life is about, about where you find meaning and purpose, about how you win, how you become better, how you get healed. There's a way, one of my favorite verses is there's a way that seems right to a person, but its end is death that there are natural, I mean, look at New Year's resolutions. Everybody's going to go find their way. No, you're not. Because a lot of the crap in our head about how we get better and how we grow is exactly that. It's just crap. And our head needs to be transformed. We've got to grow. 
by the renewing of your mind. Now, here's what it says right after that. Then, then, what is then? Well, we started with knowing you're loved. Started with emptying myself, getting rid of all my preconceived stuff. And then we started by learning and transforming and getting into the right ways of thinking. And if we do all that, then he says this, then you will be able to test and approve. Sounds like a little experimentation in there, right? Not like you're going to get a telegram, like you're going to test and approve what God's will is. And will means desire, what he desires for you. His good and pleasing and perfect will or desire. And do you see that progression? It starts with knowing all this therefore stuff that you're, look, you're forgiven for the past. That's the whole message of Jesus. I didn't come to condemn you. I came to help you. Just ask me for forgiveness and let's start over. What can we call starting over? What would be a good term for that? Now, if you're God and you're sitting there and you're Jesus and some guy, some really, really fancy leader, preacher type, let's call him Nicodemus. And you're going to try to explain all this to him. You're trying to get him to start over. What would be a good way we could explain this to Nicodemus? You know what? You know, a fresh start, a good metaphor for a fresh start is how about let's just be born again. How about that? Oh, but that sounds so religious. No, it's really not. It's a whole new life shedding all the crap that's happened to you and that you've done. Let's start over. Okay. I'll sign up for that. I'd like to start over. Well, how am I going to start over? Because you're forgiven. It's gone. Never to be brought up again. Let's start over. Let's start over. Well, how do we do that? Well, first of all, I realize how loved you are and there's safety in starting over and finding out who your new identity is. And then we go through the steps we just talked about. So I want you to ask in your path, am I so hung up in my past that I can't even get to the therefore? Now, I don't mean in un, unhealed wounds and all that, because that's what we're going to work on going forward. But I mean, the shame and the guilt and the, regrets and the blame and the unforgiving of others and all of that we'll never find an identity for the future if we can't be forgiven for the failures of the old identity of the past so it's got to start there